and welcome to Lard TV, where here we are once again talking to Mark Backhouse about his forthcoming new rules from Rise of Express, Strength and Honour. Um, in today's episode, uh, we're going to be looking at typical force composition and get an idea of the sort of units that you might have in your army. Now, we're going to pick here uh, forces from a Roman force and a Helvetian sort of Gallic force. Um, but obviously the rules do cover a much broader swathe of armies than just that. But this is a great opportunity to have a look at some units in, in specific. So tell us, Mark, tell us about the size and type of army that we're going to be fielding in Strength and Honour. Sure, OK. Well, here we've got a typical Roman force from the, the Marian period. Um, the one that might be used inside the, the Gallic Wars, and it's based loosely around uh, the Roman forces under Julius Caesar in 58 BC at the start of the Gallic Wars. Yep. Uh, an army could be made up of between about 4 and 14 units, and each unit's meant to be a large body of soldiers, roughly about a legion in size, so around about 5,000 men. In the case of cavalry or skirmishers, maybe those numbers might be a little bit smaller. In the case of warband or maybe pike phalanxes, for example, maybe mm. slightly more men. But either way, it's a big body of men is one big grouping. So let's start by looking at a typical Roman army. Uh, so this one here is uh, Caesar's army inside Gaul from 58 BC. And it's made up of different types of legions. Some are veteran legions and some are raw legions. We can identify the different units by magnetic labels that we've got on the backs of the bases there. And what's great with those is they're interchangeable and therefore they can represent lots of different forces inside different battles inside the civil wars or inside later periods as well. In two mil, we're not particularly that concerned about the type of armour or the shape of the shields especially. Uh, ultimately, uh, the advantage for this is that the units are often very flexible for that. So the backbone of the Roman army at this point here is the legion. The legions, we can see here, are organised with six different legions. I'm just going to move those out of the way. Six legions of infantry here, and each of those then is organised into ten cohorts. They're uh, formed inside what's called a triple axis, or a three-line formation, and each one of these three lines here is made up of a row of cohorts. Most of the time, the unit will stay in this way here throughout the whole battle. However, there are some special rules for legions that do allow them to be a little bit more flexible. And if you did want to form them as a single axis, or indeed strip off your rear cohorts to face a new direction, mm. you can do that as well. So, what have we got here inside the Roman force? Well, the backbone of our Roman army here is two veteran legions, the, the 9th and the famous 10th legion. Mm. These troops had come with Julius Caesar from Spain, and they're really solid fighting troops here. Mm. These are experienced soldiers, they're disciplined, they're organised, they've got very high morale, and they're going to be a real rock inside your army. They're going to be your big match winners, aren't they? And certainly that's what Caesar found. I mean, the 10th mm. is always quoted as being Caesar's favourite legion. I don't think he was happy with them all the time. There are a couple of famous occurrences <laughs> where he got a bit fed up with them, but uh, they, they were all the more keen to prove him wrong and come out fighting. So these guys are real tough veterans, aren't they? Yeah. And then along with that, then, we've also got two other experienced mm. legions of troops. These are, again, soldiers who mm. fought with Caesar in tried Spain. And we've got the 8th and uh, the 7th legion there as well. So there are two legions there in the centre. But often commanders inside Roman forces didn't always have these veteran experience units to rely on. And instead, mm. particularly during the time period of the civil wars and inside the larger armies, they were forced to rely on uh, raw legionaries to make up the numbers and freshly ra raised legions, a very common feature of the mm. rules. And Caesar inside Gaul here has got two legions within but of new raw recruits, the 11th and the 12th legions. These are solid troops, they're well armoured, they're well armed, they've been trained up to a point and they can fight, but they're still untested inside battle. And therefore, you've got to be a little bit more cautious in the way in which you're going to be using those. You can't maybe rely on them to hold up large numbers of enemy formations in quite the same way as you could maybe with the 10th Legion. So, in total then, we've got about 60 cohorts worth of troops here. Mm. And on paper then, that's a, a, a paper strength of about 30,000 legionaries all inside this force here. So, compared with most other game systems, mm. this is a pretty big force. Mm. 
Typically, however, legions weren't at full strength. Many times, particularly during the later civil war period, legions were much smaller than that, and often they were only half that strength there. And in fact, in some battles later on, by about 47 BC, mm -hmm. Caesar had legions that were barely over a thousand strong. Mm -hmm. But for this type of uh, battle here, it's in 58 BC, it's at the start of the Gallic Wars, mm -hmm. we can assume they're pretty strong. So yeah. we've got 25 to 30,000 then mm -hmm. legionaries here making up our base of our force. Now, along with that, we've also got some skirmishing units as well. And to help the Romans here, we've got some skirmishing local tribes, from the Dewey tribe, mm -hmm. who are the local Gallic friendly tribe to the Romans here. And we've also got some Numidian skirmishers. These troops are going to be the light infantry of the army. They're going to be used as scouts. They're going to be very useful at pre uh, presenting skirmish lines out in front of the legions, and also for uh, handling rough bits of terrain or to guard flanks and be kept as a reserve as well. Okay. Now we can use those in several different ways inside the battle. And at the moment, we've got them as formed up big units of light infantry representing about 1,500 javelin men, slingers and a few bowmen inside there as well. The final unit we've got inside the Roman army here is our Roman cavalry. In Gaul in 58 BC, Julius Caesar was still very much reliant on uh, Gallic cavalry and also on German mercenaries as well and maybe some Spanish horse to make up his numbers. Mm. There'd also be a few Roman cavalry added in with the legions as well who were used as messages and what we've done is we've brigaded those all together as one a cavalry unit over here. So again, that's representing about 2,000, maybe 3,000 cavalry there. So it's quite a large body of cavalry all in one place there. All right. Okay. Now that's not all the force, that's not all the units in our force harbour. There's two more that we haven't yet mentioned that ah. are, are still very important, aren't they? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, every single force has got its own baggage. And in this case here, the Romans have got a fortified camp. What's great inside the two mil scale is we can actually uh, we can actually represent an entire camp all in one piece there on the tabletop and get a sense of how important this is going to be for the Roman force. Inside an army, typically you only have one camp. However, in some large battles, for example in Philippi, you might well end up having two for each of the two different armies involved on each side for it. So this is a fortified camp here with a palisade around the outside of it. It's got ditches dug around it there as well, and that's going to be quite a useful defensive position to fall back to. But also, it's going to be an important place because the Romans are going to be storing all their supplies of corn and wheat inside it there. They've got their tents there, they've got their blankets, mm. they've got their slaves inside it too. So it's absolutely critical for their campaign, and loss of your camp is going to be a disaster inside the battle. So it's critical then that the Romans defend this. The final unit we've got is down the front here. You might not have spotted it, mm. but it's the commander himself. In this case here, it's meant to be Julius Caesar. Along with him, he's got his bodyguard, probably Germans at this point here in time, mm. and he's also got with him a few messengers and a few legates as well. Effectively, that is the, sort of the central command uh, headquarters of the army. So he's going to be allocated to one of the units inside the force, and he's going to stay with that unit there at the start of the battle, whether he can move around later on. So there we have it, the Roman force, six legions with skirmish units, some cavalry, a general and a camp. A solid, well-rounded force with real strength in its legions. But what sort of force are we likely to see them facing? OK, well, the rules will cover a really wide range of different opponents mm. of Rome. Mm. OK, so uh, we've got various different types of Gauls and Germans and ancient Britons, mm -hmm. Spanish, Numidians, mm -hmm. and we could go uh, to other nations inside Italy. So, mm. for example, during the social wars, we've mm. got other Italian tribal groups there who would fight against mm. the Romans. Spartacus, you've mentioned. Slave revolt, of course, yeah. absolutely. So we've got them going on. But if we go further eastwards, we've got Judean rebels, mm -hmm. we've got Parthians, mm -hmm. we've got Dacians, We've got Armenians, right. uh, we've got uh, uh, Mithridatic forces as mm. well, so sort of the mm. last vestiges of the successor states yeah. there. Yeah. And we've also got client kingdoms as well who could be allied back with Rome or maybe fighting um, against them. Bit of Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse is going to be a bit before this time. Oh, of course it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah, right. Well, but we, we might come to those later on yeah. another time. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping because we've had a few test games, haven't we? So yeah. I think it's important to stress that whilst the rules we've got here are covering that period from uh, the Marian reforms, 
so around 100, roughly 100, 100 uh, BC to uh, AD 200, there are going to be options for this to expand into other areas. Absolutely. So the aim is to go back and look mm. at earlier conflicts in yeah. the earlier Republic, mm -hmm. look at the rise of uh, Rome mm -hmm. itself and uh, the other successor states and Carthage and things right. like that there. So something to look forward to there as well, I hope there. Yeah. So the force mm. we've got in front of us mm. today, though, facing against mm. our Romans inside our battle, are going to be coming from modern day Switzerland. Mm. This is a, a Gallic tribe called the Helvetii. Mm. And in 58 BC, they were migrating westwards into mm. Gaul or France. Mm. And uh, in particular, they'd infringed into the lands of the Adui tribe, who were mm. a Gallic tribe who were allied with Rome. And this is one of those great battles that even if you started reading Caesar's Gallic Wars mm. and gave up after 50 pages, this is the battle you'll have read about. It's absolutely the kickoff of the whole absolutely. campaign, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Mm. And inside the rule book, we're mm. intending on playing a short mm. campaign mm. based around this mm. whole campaign mm. at Bibract mm. that you can play out mm. over a series of two or three games. So we're going to be looking today, though, at their mm. final thoughts in the big main mm. battle here. So what have we got here? inside this force. Okay, well, leading the way, we've the veteran Gallic war band made up of the best troops in the Helvetii army. Now, fighting together in tightly packed ranks with overlapping shields, equipped with a larger proportion of armoured troops and generally more competent than the other tribes. Uh, these warriors are man for man a match for the Roman legions, but they will probably not be able to coordinate quite as effectively as the well-drilled legions of Rome. Now, so the main body of the Helvetii is made up of six units mm. of warband troops. These are from different tribal groups mm. and they're all allied together under this sort of coalition under the Helvetii tribe. So we've got the Bowie, the Raki, the Tolingi, mm. uh, the Tigurini, uh, along with the Helvetii as well here. Mm -hmm. Now, inside these units here, they're meant to represent between maybe five and 8,000 warriors for each unit. They've got well-equipped warriors in the front ranks, so imagine the nobles there mm -hmm. with their chain armour, their big shields and mm -hmm. impressive sort of birded helmets and big plumes and uh, ferocious uh, motifs on their shields. But behind them, we've got sort of less confident, uh, less well-trained uh, part-time warriors who are probably armed with shields and spears there who are keen to make up the numbers, but when push comes to shove, maybe not quite as skillful as the professional Roman legions in this time period here. They're going to be enthusiastic, but they're going to be quite uncoordinated at times. So the challenge for a Gallic commander is going to be to how to use their weight of numbers to attack and break through the Roman formations. They'll quickly lose heart if the initial attacks falter. Um, so this is going to be quite a challenge for the, the Gallic commander to coordinate in battle. So, Along with these normal warband groups, some of the groups are identified as being slightly different. In particular, we've got the Bowie tribe over here, who are a fanatical warband unit. This tribe was particularly famous for their ferocity and their tenacity inside battle. Uh, in earlier times, they often fought naked. By this time here, they've probably remembered to wear their trousers, fortunately for us. In two mil, luckily, we don't get to see the gory <laughs> details, do we? Uh, so this is going to be our main force of warbands. Along with that then, we've also got skirmishers who are going to make up the numbers. And these are often younger warriors in a more open formation. And in many ways, they fight in just the same way as the earlier Roman skirmishers we saw. They're armed with slings and javelins and uh, clubs and that kind of thing there. But they're not really close uh, combat troops here. They're designed to skirmish on the flanks or to support the main war bands going forward. Well, the Gauls were renowned for the quality of their cavalry. I presume some of them are present. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And inside this Helvetii force over mm. here, we've represented them with two units of uh, Gallic cavalry over here. Again, these are well-equipped, uh, well-armoured cavalrymen on reasonably good mounts. They're confident and they're so good that, of course, the Romans adopted many Gallic cavalry inside their own forces during the wars. Mm. So they're going to be quite a big threat for the Romans here during this battle. And while mobile, they don't have quite the same staying power as a Roman legion, but they certainly can pack a similar punch for a short period of time. But if it's on a longer drawn out melee, they're going to struggle a little bit more against the Roman legions. Mm. Along with that, we've also got a camp. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, if you were fighting in a static battle, the Gauls might, for example, use a, a sort of a hill fort or uh, an apidium if you were inside Gaul, mm. there is their camp or their base for their baggage. But in this case here, we've got a wagon lager. 
and that's made up of a, a group of wagons in a big circle with their cattle inside it there and also their women and their uh, children and uh, the older warriors and that kind of thing. So that's going to represent their baggage and again for the Helvetii it's absolutely critical. It would be a disaster if they lost that baggage yeah. there because they need that to be able to migrate into the Adui territory. Yeah, I'm thinking and these, these obviously we've got them marked up here today again with with magnetic strips to show what unit they are but i'm thinking about the battle of watling street when they mm. uh, when the britons had their wagon lager with their women folk in that watching the battle and so these models can be multi-purpose really can't absolutely they? so with a simple switch over of the different mm. labels here mm. my gauls quite often turn into germans all right into ancient britons and they quite often make up the numbers inside the slave revolt army as well with the great unwashed groups of ex-slaves who are ill-trained but make up the numbers at the back lines of their slave revolt army. Okay, so in total, we've got 50,000 warriors here, 4,000 cavalry, something like that? Something like that, yeah. When we get them on the table up against the Romans, we're talking about 80,000 warriors. This is a really, really big battle, and this is one of the joys of this scale and um, the strength and honour is that that smaller scale allows you to play a really big battle on a six by four table or even smaller. And um, that's something that I've not really seen um, with any other scale. And especially the way they're set up, your mindset is focusing on commanding legions rather than commanding individual cohorts or centuries. Okay, well, there we go. We've had a look at the forces that are involved. In our next film, we're going to be having a look at how we're going to deploy them onto the table and how we get everything set up to start to play a game. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll like this uh, video. And if you'd like to put comments below, we'll try and respond to that and give you any answers to any questions that you have. But we'll look forward to seeing you soon.